Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, uh, our uh, first speaker this morning is Dr. John Thompson from the University of Maryland, and who I looked up to for the last 20 years for, uh, uh, in a number of ways, uh, not only for his scientific contributions, but uh, for his scientific leadership. Um, so we tend to underestimate in science, you know, that uh, uh, somebody builds these uh, instruments and we get the data, we do the science, but we don't really recognize, you know, all the efforts that uh, went into creating these programs. And to me, John epitomizes those, uh, the building of these programs, you know, not only in the country, but also on an international uh, um, level. So. I don't think I know anyone who is involved in as many international programs as, as John is. So while he's doing the research and being a dean at the university and you know, finds the time to build these programs, he's truly amazing to me. And uh, today what I specifically asked him to do is to really reflect on his career because he has such broad experience in uh, not only in conducting the research but also in creating the programs. And I think that's what, uh, that, that's the kind of view that you're going to get from him today. And uh, take it away, John. I'm glad uh, you, you found uh, our, uh, our uh, experiment to be uh, interesting and uh, willing to join us. Well, well, thank you very much for your uh, more than kind words. And uh, I assume you can hear me clearly, can you? Yep. Very good. Uh, well, uh, uh, it, it's a little difficult to try and summarize what has now been an increasingly long career. Uh, as I point out to my graduate students uh, on a number of occasions, is that my hiking boots are considerably older than all of them. Um, I think they're about 42 years old now, so I've been going a long time. And let me give a little uh, retrospective, uh, uh, but also to make an initial comment that Normally, graduate students are, are, are rightly are told is that it's hard work, intelligence, application, but also you know there's chance as well that comes in. And uh, what I, as we go through, I've got a green exclamation mark where I think that chance and luck came in. But the trick about luck is that you need to recognise when it arrives and not ignore it. Uh, needless to say, I'm going to talk primarily about work on on, on, on land cover and the efforts that I've made to try, along with many other people, to try and get more objective information on, on online cover. So again, a little bit of context, uh, you know, I got my bachelor's in 1967, uh, uh, which is a very long uh, time, time ago. I suppose I could have put a little uh, exclamation mark by the fact that my department was a very early adopter of, of, of quantitative methods. Like many people of my generation, I took no master's degree. Uh, I stayed in the same department to do my PhD, and the number of courses I took in order to get my PhD was precisely zero. The British system is different. Uh, it was also very different uh, because of uh, the, the fact that there was almost a complete absence of computing, if it's, if it's possible to think, think of that. There was no real computer at the University College, which is a very good uh, university, and, and, until uh, uh, 1967. I started off by working in fluvial geomorphology and was very fortunate that there was a major library uh, just across the way from my office, which had lots of papers from the, from the USGS, and that started my interest in fluvial geomorphology. I was also very lucky that I was able to spend five months in an expedition to Mato Grosso uh, before all the deforestation actually actually started. And that, I was very lucky to have uh, an advisor, Eric Brown, who, 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 who made that possible. But then at the end of the PhD, I decided to go out of fluvial geomorphology. It needed more math than I had, uh, or alternatively, I was going to be involved in very long, boring process studies. And I would advise all graduate students, when, they, when you get to the end of your PhD, ask yourself, do you really want to carry on doing this for the rest of your life? I decided I didn't and wanted to move on to, on, 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 on to, on to other things. So I started off my teaching, first teaching position was in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And that was when I was kind of the equivalent of, of an assistant professor. And that's when I really got interested in the significance of terrain and the ability of terrain to sustain human usage. I stayed there long and ended up going to the University of Reading, 
And uh, I was again very fortunate that, that, the, that the person, uh, one of the professors there, a guy called Ronnie Navigier, uh, was an early adopter of remote sensing, though not digital remote sensing, and he had managed to get our Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense to uh, part with very large uh, sums of money. Um, I would say that the first years when I was at the University of Reading, I was pretty mediocre. I, 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 I did do a tremendous amount of uh, really worthwhile research. I was very fortunate that I had some very good graduate students, in particular uh, Chris Justice. Again, one of the important things you know, as you move through your career is you get good graduate students because uh, uh, you need to be continuously revived. I think that's one of the big disadvantages often of, w of working in uh, government research labs is you don't have, you don't have the graduate students to, to, to the same extent. But I was fortunate that I did lots and lots of field work all, all over Europe and in North Africa and, 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 and elsewhere. One of the big problems that we had in terms of getting going was that there was no high performance computing, there was virtually no computing, uh, and the cost of image processing uh, was really prohibitive. Eventually I got very frustrated and actually built myself uh, a digital image processing system, which I think must have been the world's slowest ever. It took something like about 15 minutes to, to load a 512 by 512 image, but nevertheless we were starting to get it in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the business. At that time, the European Space Agency was not doing much, and frankly, the UK was, 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 doing, uh, 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 was doing even less. So what was the big breakthrough into real remote sensing? Well, again, there's a green exclamation mark. It was chance. Uh, Jim Tucker, who I suppose everybody here uh, knows well from Goddard, happened to come across the, to, to, to the uh, United Kingdom. I think it was some sort of uh, scientific tourism which he tends to specialize in. And uh, because he met my student, Chris Justice, Chris Justice got a postdoc at Goddard. And then I happened to be on, on leave of absence at Clark University, and I visited uh, Goddard, and for that matter also the laboratory for application of remote sensing at Purdue University. And I was then offered a postdoc at Goddard uh, from 80 to 81. And that was just a fabulous place to work, especially then. That was the place to work in terms of global change of science and, 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 and remote sensing. And I started doing some Landsat land cover work, but I still said that it was fairly mediocre. So I think a lesson to you is that uh, if you want to take any lessons from this at all, you can be a bit of a late starter after you start your career, and you can, you can still have a fair amount of success. You don't necessarily need to be successful at every single stage, stage, stage of your career and families intrude and all sorts of things. Well, in the, by the early 1980s, you know, a lot of us were talking. We said, well, perhaps remote sensing is already finished. Now remote sensing is gone. The biggest uh, project, uh, into, uh, uh, and this is outside of uh, geological applications, was AgriStars. And that was just cancelled summarily in the, in the early 1980s. Then the virtually the only terrestrial remote sensing work was actually gov government labs. At the same time, a particular idiot in NOAA decided it would be a very good thing to privatize Landsat, and so the cost went to more than $4,000 uh, a, a, a seed. So we didn't even have any data which we could scarcely use. And when I look at the decline in sensors at the moment, we're perhaps meeting an, a, you know, another period like that when we think, well, perhaps you know, do, 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 do we really have a future or not? I'm sure we do. So what happened next? I think there were really two main aspects of re revitalization. One which was very important was Landsat 4, which led to the creation of science teams. Uh, but that was a close run thing. Uh, Landsat 4 uh, uh, was due to be launched with the TM, and a very short time beforehand, uh, NASA decided that there was a shortfall, a relatively minor shortfall, of about uh, uh, $30 million. And our friends from DOD turned up at the meet, key meeting and said they would find the 30 million. Had it not been for them, I don't believe there would have been uh, a Landsat for a TM program, and goodness knows what would have happened to, the, to, to us then. But then there was also, thanks uh, in large part to, to, in all sorts of different ways, to, to Jim Tucker, we began to look at the possibility of using the dear old ABHRR. Uh, in order to observe uh, the land at far broader scales than had ever been, ever been uh, po po possible before. 
and uh, we can talk about just how many contributions you've made as, as and when. Then we received a ludicrous challenge by a person some of you may have heard of, Jimmy Weber, who was then at NASA headquarters, and he said, I'll give you, I think it was something like about fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and I want you to give me a continental land cover map, you know, the first ever, and you've got six months to do it. And uh, Jim and I were insane to have agreed since he was at Goddard and I was back at Reading. Uh, and at that time, there were just no standardized products. But there was a polar projection GBI product being created by NOAA. This is really just for browsing for image quality. And so we had someone who was smart enough to do the programming to reproject it. We decided to composite to monthly images to get rid of all the damn, damn clouds. And we realized the only way in which we were ever going to be able to deal with the, the information there uh, was to use the, the vegetation index as, a, as something which normalized a lot of problems. And we would use that directly to classify and monitor, monitor what was there. And we did it in six months. Uh, uh, it was very interesting talking to people about it and showing them the results. We're all used to seeing now the uh, greening up of Africa, you know, as the, as the uh, intertropical convergence zone moves north and then comes south. People will look at the images and say, these are just artifacts. These are not real. Your pixels are too big. Uh, and in fact, uh, Jim had to work very hard to convince science to uh, accept the paper. And one of the reviewers was actually convinced that we were just, we were just some sort of swindlers and that we were just showing the things which were completely artificial just because people had never seen uh, I I images like that before. Well, you know, uh, th things were going very well in the UK for me, actually, at, 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 that, at that particular time. And, uh, you know, I, I was given a very large, major-funded research center. It helped that some of my ex-students by that time were taking in up leadership positions. You see, graduate students are so important for helping, uh, helping advisors rather than the other way around. And also, I think it helped that I'd taken various leadership roles in the UK and Europe. But I think also what helped is that I'd made big efforts to be an effective speaker. Some of the people saying now he's an effective speaker, I don't believe it. But I am a fairly effective speaker. I practice hard. And so many students do themselves down by giving the most incredibly boring talks. And uh, one thing I would recommend to you is, uh, is, is, is get in front of a video camera and just see how boring you really are when you're giving presentations and try and, try and improve your presentations because this will certainly help you uh, in, in, in your careers. So then I was persuaded to come to the New World and came to join Maryland in 1989 as Chair of Geography. Uh, Sam Gallon and Steve Principal were in the faculty and Chris Justice was on the research faculty. It took some time to get things up and running. University of Maryland in those days were a really sleepy uh, outpost. And when you change countries, as some of you have found out, and funding priorities change, you're challenged to, 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 get, to, get the, uh, to get resources. But gradually we've built up the department. I think why uh, Maryland has been so successful in different ways, we've always been focused on what remote sensing gives us on a scientific basis rather than being interested in remote sensing for remote sensing's sake. MODIS was huge for all of us, uh, for, the, you know, for, the, for the department and for us individually. Uh, we helped to justify the 250 meter bands. That was a really tough argument, which we very near, 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 nearly lost. I also mistakenly did not apply for the team membership on the first round, and this is another lesson to learn, I guess, because uh, we, we assumed if two people were applying to do work from the same department, probably uh, only one or two at most would get it. And then, of course, we found out that uh, uh, Miami had got three team memberships for, for the oceans, and so that was a lesson, is, is never worry about competing with other people in the same department. Uh, uh, Rama asked me to just comment on this particular uh, paper, which many people see as, a, a, as fairly seminal, which was really just a review paper, uh, which was just to say, hey guys, land cover characterization is really important, and by the way, we know very little about it. 
and uh, I think that was a shock and uh, the next speaker, Steve Running, always comments on this, that that, that was a real eye-opener to, to him because he assumed that we knew where the world's uh, forests uh, were. If you look at what's happened since the paper, you just see now that some of the things being proposed are now just normal. I mean, everybody recognizes that you have to adopt a multi-temple approach. You, the value of modis for land cover characterization is clear to all. Uh, atmospheric correction is the norm, uh, though only recently for Landsat. Since then, we've actually started to look at land cover in a lot of different ways, and of course we now often look at continuous fields, and that's, I can't see any mention of that within the paper uh, uh, at all. Uh, what's probably though true to say is that actually getting some accurate numbers, it took an awfully long time. And I would say that really, for example, forest cover change globally that really was not established until the recent proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences papers by Hansen et al. To, 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 to in particular. One of the things the paper asked for is sensory integration. I think that still remains the exception rather than the rule in virtually all aspects of remote sensing. Now, this was the paper by Matt Hansen, the second of those, uh, those uh, two articles. I think this is the first honest uh, map or product describing percentage forest cover loss ever created. Uh, uh, and, and it tells us all sorts of things which uh, we kind of suspected but were certainly not in the official statistics. So if you look at Canada, for example, you see all the changes occurring there. But of course, the official can Canadian statistics say nothing is happening, but they don't ca count forest cover loss due to burning as being forest, forest loss. Of course, we see uh, all the changes which we're very familiar with in, in, uh, in, in, in South America, uh, but then we also see the huge changes which take place in southeastern United States. And it was really uh, relatively recently that the amount of turnover of forest cover was even appreciated, but you can see it's one of those biggest signals when you're, when you're looking at the globe. And I think the credit to that probably should go, even though it's well manifested on this, very probably that should go to, 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 to Sam Goward who was, uh, and, and his co-workers who were interested in, uh, in, in the carbon cycle and actually started to look at what was happening in large areas of southeastern United States. We're just amazed to see whole landscapes turning over in, 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 in 20, 20 years. Now, what I've always been done, and, and Rama referred to this, is to be involved in defining the future. Uh, a lot of people you know, tend to assume that things just happen because unknown people make decisions or everything's going to work out all right anyway. But what it seemed to me in the, in the early 1990s was almost a complete lack of international national strategies associated with with defining the needs of the terrestrial community, not only with reference to uh, land cover, but the terrestrial community uh, as a whole. So I got involved very much with the IGPP DIS, and the big thing which came out of that, and a lot of people responsible, not just me, was the one kilometer global aviator R project and the product which was created from that. And then also the global climate observing system, which has been reasonably successful, the global terrestrial observing system, which has been pretty much a, a, a damn failure, uh, though there's some signs that it may come back. Then the sea which is the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, which I uh, try to be involved in a lot in order to influence people in space agencies. Then Gossy Gold, which is concerned with forest cover, which has been very successful, I think, in really uh, setting agendas for uh, what, what we really need, and then various other activities, National Academy of Sciences Committees and Boards, National NOAA Committees. Why do you do this? Because otherwise you're leaving it to others to define what your future is going to be. It means you're, what it also means though, if you can actually persuade people what the future should be, it positions you extremely well then to take advantage of new opportunities. People in NASA, for example, often said, you know, it's amazing how well Maryland at times manages to position itself so that when the AOs come out, you're ready. But it's because so many people here and elsewhere have helped set those agendas to which NASA then responds. But it only really works if you can work with others, and the most important thing is to let others take the credit. Take no credit for this at all. 
Uh, when we were doing the one kilometer aviator R project, CEOs, uh, the Committee on Observing Satellites, uh, we having defined what it was and persuading various people to do it, CEOs suddenly declared it as their project. Some of my colleagues were really sad about that. I was, I was absolutely delighted because if CEOs took ownership, it increased the chance that it was going to be successful. Oh, uh, well, this is slightly out of place. Um, or, or, or this is just to point out that the actual uh, FAO figures uh, you know, really completely contradict uh, uh, those of the Hansen et al. Uh, product. And if you refer back, you, 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 you'll, 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 be able to, you'll be able to see. Then another really important thing for me was getting involved with the uh, uh, ESIP Federation, who are holding their meeting uh, as, as we speak. Uh, uh, somewhere in Wisconsin anyway. And this led also to setting up the global link of a facility. Now, I started to try and build up linkages with computer science here at Merrin uh, pretty early on. And we were successful in getting major funding from the NSF for high performance computing in the late, 90, uh, late 1990s. Fortunately, we were so ahead of the game that I think quite honestly looking back, it was a flop because it, even though our computer science department is very good, actually optimizing high performance computing is no easy task, is it? No, everybody knows that has ever tried. And we were so early that it was really difficult to get the people with the right training to help us uh, uh, ca ca carry out the work. So you can't be too far ahead of the game. It's also a, 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 lesson, a lesson to be learned. Well, the ESIP Federation was a great opportunity. And here's another little green exclamation mark. Uh, uh, relatively few people applied because it was so new and people didn't really know what it was about. Uh, and so when you see new opportunities, you should think, can I modify what I do so that it fulfills this particular opportunity? Because if not many people apply, it makes it a lot easier to, uh, to, to, to be successful. And so we set up the global uh, land cover facility and you know the very long-standing relations in the IT world through 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 through, through ESIP. I suppose one of the big things that we did it just opened up the use of Landsat and showed how that it could be made much more usable than than, than it was. This is a bit of an old view graph. We're well over a petabyte of downloads now, and we're still distributing 30,000, 40,000 Landsat scenes that sit scenes a month. A lot of the reason why people still like coming to us is because we ensured that the, uh, uh, that the data was all in a uniform uh, uh, form. And when you come to the site, it's about whether you're looking at Modis products, Landsat data, or whatever, uh, everything is just arranged in a very, very similar, similar way. So it's very easy for people to, 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 to navigate uh, uh, around it. So where are we now? Well, uh, I'm now Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, which seems slightly strange since I'm, uh, I'm only barely a social scientist anyway. Uh, um, I argue that since I look at changing land use in the world, that that somehow justifies it. But pe people seem to be tolerant of the fact that I really came from a non-social science background. I'm still maintaining research programs, work using Landsat, also maintaining team membership of MODIS for the, for, for the BCF. I still have graduate students. Some of I note have nothing better to do uh, this morning than to attend this particular uh, uh, workshop since they sh should know what I'm doing, but perhaps they don't. But what I've also done is to, uh, in the last few years, is to build up relationships with people in China. And if uh, some very good working relationships. We're just uh, are opening a, a joint center with Beijing uh, Normal University, also working with various uh, uh, components of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Academy of, 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 of Scientists. I'm going to Chengdu to the Mountain Institute this October to talk about them. There are just wonderful opportunities in China to work with people and, and frankly, uh, uh, to, 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 to make a difference, hopefully, in the way in which they're, 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 they're developing their programs. Uh, and if you ever have the chance to go to China, I'm talking to the non-Chinese, uh, always take up the opportunity, uh, if only because uh, the Chinese are, <coughs> without doubt, the best hosts in the world. So you will be treated well. So this is just to show uh, the outcome of some of the work which we're doing with measures, and so we produce these uh, global uh, products of surface reflectance with atmospheric correction of Landsat data. 
And I think that all being well, USGS will be making such uh, uh, corrective products available in the future. We've really got to, we've got to be serious about terrestrial remote sensing. We've just got to forget about looking at the top of the atmosphere. We, 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 need, we need surface properties. And this is just about to be published. This is the, 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 the first uh, uh, Landsat, uh, water wall Landsat product of forest cover the whole world. Uh, also with, uh, with, with, with the changes to the whole world as well. Uh, we're not willing yet to publish numbers because it's a challenge to make sure that we've got our, that the errors well characterized, uh, but, uh, but, but, but we're well, we're, we are well on the way. Uh, it's interesting that one of the subtitles of this, of course, is high performance computing. But I think we have to recognize that for many uh, uh, applications now, you know, you don't need high performance computing, relatively speaking. Uh, you do for some tasks, for sure. But, it, you know, it really is within the grasp of everybody to be able to do a global characterization of the Earth using Landsat data. This is, a, this is our puny little system, and we can, do, we can do global atmospheric correction of a single image of the whole world in a week. So, it, 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 and, and this, this we bought three or four years ago. We could do far better if we spent the same amount of money, m m m money now. So things really are an awful lot easier than, the, the, than they were. So I was asked to say a few things about future challenges. Well, routine, routine monitoring of land cover is really close. And I certainly will not now go into this area unless I really thought I'd had some great uh, winning uh, uh, idea to improve land cover, land cover characterization. The thing to do is to, is, to, is to try and get into those areas where the people aren't working, not to follow the pack. And uh, I think that's why I managed to be uh, reasonably successful in my land cover work because n nobody else was hardly doing any work on, 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 it, on it at all. One of the big problems we've still got is reliable error estimation. Uh, I haven't seen error, any error, error estimation in even continental products, which I believe in. It's just a, a remarkably dull, boring, enormous job to do, and we've still not got our act together. Uh, I do see that the integration of radar and optical remote I still can't believe why it's so understudied and why people don't, don't do that. Uh, there are newer technologies such as LIDARs coming along, but obviously we have a real dearth of, 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 of missions to look at. One of the big areas, I think, must be the integration of the biophysical dimensions of global change and human dimensions. And I think this is going to be essential. The biggest forcing factor of global change you know, are decisions made by human beings. It's got less and less to do with the, with the uh, biophysical world. It's what, the, what human beings are, are doing. And what that means is we've got to engage social scientists, not just mugging up on a little bit of social science. Economists, obviously, for a whole range of uh, to understand a whole range of decisions, understanding decision making itself, and that's why we need to engage people from psychology. Governance is crucial, so we need to involve people from political science and sociology. There's issues like terrorism and global change. You know, where you have real problems associated with global change, this often leads to state instability. And we need, obviously, improved modeling of human behavior, not just with uh, standard agent-based models and this, but certainly trying to improve them. And then we do need high-performance computing, uh, for sure. So I've been saying this for years, but I still say as a community, we need to be better organized in demanding what we need. And the terrestrial community remains very disorganized compared with the, ocean, the, the, the oceans and atmospheric community. Just some final words. Uh, a successful career in global change as science is increasingly one of successful collaborations. This started out as my story, and it finishes as ours. So, although it has its downsides, I do think a research university is just a terrific place to be. As I say, graduate students should make a huge difference. One thing which people may or may not mention is that I think it's very important that you have high ethical standards. One thing, just on a purely practical basis, is people can't trust you. They're not likely to be collaborating uh, with you. But in any event, I think you should always treat everyone in your organization with respect, whatever their, their role, and have a zero tolerance for intolerance. And finally, if you don't find research fun, then go and try something else. You'll be better paid, and you'll, have a, uh, and you'll enjoy yourself more. Research has to be fun. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you, John. Thank you for that uh, perspective. And uh, I will open the forum for uh, questions. Um, anybody around the table? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, John. I did have a kind of a technical question about what your criteria were for defining the forest loss. When you're talking about your forest loss maps, how are you defining what constitutes a lost forest? Yeah, well, we're, 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 we're taking two, two, two basic approaches. Uh, the one which is the simple one is just taking the the the, the, the you know the common common um, uh, boundaries for forests, and we're taking 30 percent and 60 percent open forest or open woodland and closed forest. In part because a lot of people are very interested in in, in, in those that, 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 those sorts of numbers. But we're also developing a much more probabilistic approach, which is to understand. The, the errors associated with uh, forest cover at any particular uh, uh, date, and then uh, assessing whether or not forest cover change has taken place on a probabilistic basis, uh, uh, understanding the, the uncertainty of both, both of those dates. And um, that's obviously far more in keeping with uh, vegetation continuous fields. Classification, crude classification, always has enormous problems even those people are, are, are always very interested in those particular numbers. Okay. Thank you. John. I had a question, John. Um, the, the map of uh, forest, the global map of forest cover, Hansen et al., 2000, um, is, is a very... That's a fine, Very exciting, and um, I'm wondering about um, what the impact of cloud cover was on um, those estimates. I really appreciated your comment about our inability to um, have highly accurate error estimations, but I'm thinking about sort of um, broad trends since equatorial Africa is one of the cloudy places. Um, do you think so we're missing some of that or a substantial part of it because of, of the cloud cover? I think in the far west, and, and, and the, the, product, the thing I put up there was Matt Hansen's. I'm not taking uh, 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 a particular credit for that uh, at all, of course. Um, but, but the way in which he, which, which he, he carries out the work, which essentially is to use MODIS data to understand uh, and then look at the relationship of the MODIS data to Landsat data, you know what the modus signal means in terms of, 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 of loss. Because modus is not perfect at getting rid of all the uh, cloud, the, you know, compositing, you know, and if you pick the right uh, um, uh, characteristics from the, from the multi-temporal signal, a lot of those effects of cloud are, are, are eliminated. And then, of course, you're picking your Landsat data in order to have cloud-free cloud -free scenes uh, as, 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 as well. I think that the future certainly must lie in, in, in really two things. Firstly, the, the, the sort of work that David Roy is doing uh, in his well product, which essentially is to do almost pixel by pixel uh, um, examination to pick the best Landsat pixel in a given time period, uh, is, 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 is clearly uh, you know, one of the ways to go to minimize effect of cloud. The other thing is, though, is, is we need daily Landsat data. It's obvious. So here we are waiting for, 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 the, for the next Landsat, which will give us the same boring frequency that we have be, before. And what we really need is daily images. And we, as people have said for, for a while, you know, we, we need to modisize Landsat. We need to have all the compositing and all the various things which we did with Modis, but at Landsat resolution. It's a great lack of vision of the uh, of, of, of space ages and the terrestrial community. Uh, after all these years, uh, we're, we're, we're still waiting for uh, such an uh, inadequate frequency of imaging, which will be every 16 days, or if we combine with Sentinel, uh, then it, then it would be every, every eight days. It's ridiculous. A long answer. So I have a question uh, from the chat room. Um, this yeah. is from uh, Hamad Gilani. 
he is asking um, that you talked about a number of global initiatives and he is wondering if there is any kind of a synergy among all those global initiatives that you are working on. Well, I mean, some of those are what I used to work on. You know, you, you, you move into areas, you move out of areas. Uh, 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 the, 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 risk, the risk synergy and people in those groups do, 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 work, do work together. Um, uh, one of the, and, and one of them that I didn't mention on there, of course, is the group on, on, on Earth observations, which, I, which I've been uh, in, involved in uh, uh, on and off. And these people do try to do try to work with each other. Um, it, it, often the constituencies are different, and so that's why you often need why why, why you need uh, uh, di 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 different groups. So if you're trying to work within the framework of uh, 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 meteorological agencies, you know, who often provide a lot of the important climate data, you have to work through the Global Climate Observing System, which is part of the World Meteorological Organization. And the governing board of the World Meteorological Organization are the heads of, very largely, the heads of Met offices. Uh, if you're interested in trying to influence the, uh, the space agencies, then CEOS provides a very good forum because basically to be a member of CEOS means that you have to be responsible for uh, a, a space agency which puts Earth observing satellites. So it tends to be complicated, but I, I assure you that compared with uh, uh, many other uh, activities uh, uh, in, in climate and oceans, we're, we're relatively simple. You just need a lot of different structures to maintain these things internationally and to persuade people to move forward in the way you think is important. Thank you. Um, any other questions that are on the table? So I have another uh, question and comment from uh, Ranga Maineni. Um, so he's talking about uh, Hansen's paper yeah, that came out in PNAS. Um, so he was wondering about the um, the issue with the with the, with the Finnish forest. Uh, what happened there? It seems there was some kind of a yeah, you, you, you asked Matt that, and I think that, you know, that, that, that there are issues with that paper, just as there are, you know, with, 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 with any paper. But what, what I would say is it's the first, that illustration, and I won't go into too much detail in any particular part, but it's the first illustration of what's happened to forest-covered change, which bears any resemblance to the truth whatsoever. So I, I have a question. Can I tell you, there, there is a comment also about forest use. And I think this is a real issue, that we almost always must be clear about forest use and forest cover. And uh, I, I even proposed, but I got nowhere with it, is that when you're interested in cover, don't ever use the term forest at all. Because foresters always think about forests as being land use. We tend to say forest cover, but that, but they still don't really understand it that, that way. And so foresters everywhere uh, think of uh, forests as being used. And that's the reason why Canada always reports to the Forest Resource Assessment that they have exactly the same amount of forest cover uh, and there never is any change because they're just regarded as, 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 as a land use. Now, the fact a lot is destroyed for them is, is neither here nor there. If you're interested in the carbon cycle, it is rather relevant. So I have a, a question. So, yeah. so land cover research seems to be one of those areas where you could really deploy the social networking tools. Uh, so is there any um, initiative along those lines to, to use the web and uh, all the people that have uh, cameras and all sorts of uh, sensors that they're carrying around. Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 there has been, have been some crowdsourcing efforts and people taking, you know, pictures of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that longitude intersections of various places. Um, I, 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 I'm not personally, I mean, I think if, if a group of people talking to each other, right, directly, that then perhaps real social networking, it could be helpful. 
but just taking random pictures around the world, I mean, it depends so much how you take the darn picture, and I'm, I'm not sure it actually produces particularly re re reliable information. But I think, I, think it's a, I think it's a good point having perhaps limited number of people uh, exchanging views and people being able perhaps in real time to walk around and so people would actually see what you're, what, you know, what, 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 what you're talking about could, 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 could be very helpful. And there's a question here asking what do you mean by routine monitoring of land cover? I mean that it just becomes something which you uh, could just give it to an agency. I mean it, it, it starts uh, some of the basic land cover monitoring just falls outside of the framework of what people probably in universities should be doing. Uh, it's noticeable that in, uh, it didn't quite work out, but that in, uh, in China the, the job of generating a global land cover product, a Landsat resolution, was given to the, uh, what's it, the National Geomatic Center for China. I think I, think I got that. Uh, perhaps make sure you could uh, uh, type some, something in the chat if I got that wrong. I wanted to bring up the, um, the issue of the optical and radar remote sensing um, integration for land use across large areas. Um, I have a little experience with that, and one of the things that really struck me even after two years of working on it is that um, the radar folks, because of the radar uh, sensors are inherently so different than the optical ones, um, the pre-processing is entirely different and the um, kind of mindset or the models that they're coming uh, with are very different. And so it, it was, it is quite a challenge. Um, and I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing about what, what could be done to, to address that at sort of a, an earlier stage before those models have sort of been um, um, ingrained. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, it is just amazing that the two communities still don't seem to manage to, 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 to talk to each other. One model I, I thought about, which I thought have perhaps had the prospect of work, and it goes back to a uh, previous uh, uh, topic, will be, uh, since we are pretty ignorant at times about what's happening in, in Central Africa, because the very high cloud amount, that uh, have a joint project between people who specialize in optical remote sensing, radar remote sensing, try and create the best uh, uh, forest cover product and forest cover change product uh, with, 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 which is possible to create. And you know, actually getting people working together on the same uh, activity would, 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 would be a good idea. It also seems to me that in terms of acquisition strategies, the space agency could be and should be getting together rather, uh, uh, rather more uh, because it, uh, it would seem to be a no-brainer is that one of the areas where you need to decide to acquire uh, uh, radar data is, is, is in those places where we know we have a very high cloud cover. But so far as I know, nobody's ever really carried out a systematic uh, acquisition strategy in that way, even though that recommendation has been made uh, a, a number of times. Xiaopeng Song uh, asked a question, which was answered uh, in part by a, uh, uh, a fellow student of his, Hao Tang. Uh, uh, he was asking whether we're expecting any LIDAR missions at NASA or ESA or any other agencies around the world. I mean, I, the fact that NASA has not put up a LIDAR is just an absolute disgrace. I mean, it's an absolute disgrace that I mean, they've been talking and on about it uh, for ages. There was a really excellent opportunity to put a LIDAR on space station. Instead, we got some mission which is supposed to improve our ability to track hurricanes, which I thought we could do pretty well anyway, whereas when it comes to the vertical structure of vegetation, we know virtually nothing. So, uh, yet another dumb decision as far as I'm concerned by uh, our masters at, uh, 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 at NASA. And the loss of BCL was bad and destiny, the, the, the fiasco that was there. So, uh, Dalton will come uh, and, uh, uh, you know, ISAC 2 will be along, yeah, but we, but we really do want it at all possible 
uh, lidars which are designed for, 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 for specifically for looking at vegetation and having appropriate acquisition strategies to do it properly. So I'm a little passionate still about some of these things. <laughs> And of course, I wasn't talking about anybody at your fine institution, rather. Not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so this, this land cover research has evolved uh, over the past, you know, 20 years, you know, starting with 8 kilometers and to 1 kilometer to 500 meters to now 300 meters. So where, where do you think that uh, we're going to end up in the, in the next five years? Well, I know what we should be doing. Whether we would do it or not, of course, it's, 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 different, it's different matter. We, it's, it's obvious we should be thinking about doing systematic uh, mapping and uh, monitoring, not necessarily wall to wall, but globally in selected areas. Uh, you know, a, a, a five meter and finer resolutions. I mean, you know, what pe pe people talk a lot about, about uh, you know, red, for example, uh, reduced emissions through uh, deforestation and degradation. But quite honestly, you know, uh, you could do a little bit, you can do some things with uh, uh, Landsat data associated with, with, with red, but when it comes down to it, you really much finer resolution if you're really concerned with. Uh, monitoring what uh, the, the uh, individual person may be doing within the forest area. I, I know certainly the people who are uh, developing an operational system in, uh, in Mexico, uh, um, they, that, that's, that, that they are not looking to uh, uh, 30 meter data, they're looking for look, 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 look 5 meter data. And really, what we should be having is, you know, is, is, is uh, routine uh, five-meter data. So we should be having uh, the sort of acquisition strategy which currently we have for Landsat. We should be having that for five-meter data, which is to ensure a couple of looks uh, for every place on Earth, preferably cloud-free, on, 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 on a uh, uh, on a yearly basis. Now, sometimes people sort of say, "Why do you keep asking for the moon?" I'm not asking for the moon. I'm just sort of saying, can we just have a bit of vision? So th think about what happened in the in the uh, uh, late 1960s when, uh, in answer to various complaints about the uh, uh, earth science community, uh, it was agreed that there could be a civilian earth observing satellite, right? Or Earth at first, and then became then, then, then became Landsat, which of course was launched in 1972. So in the late 1960s, and some people have the vision to say, why don't we put something up which will look at the Earth, admittedly often looking at the cloud, but we'll look at the Earth you know, uh, basically every 16 or so days, I think it was 18 days in, the, in, in those days, at 80 meter resolution. Can you see what an unbelievable uh, piece of uh, visionary thought that was in the late 1960s to say we're going to have digital data of the whole Earth. And since then, we have the tremendous expansion uh, associated with EOS. And of course, most of what happened uh, in, in EOS was a result of thinking in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the 80s uh, under and, and, and Shelby Tilford. And then, since then, frankly, in large part, that we seem to have gone to sleep. The rate of advance has slowed down desperately. And I think everybody's got to be, you know, far more demanding of what space agencies do than we than, 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 than we currently are. We've got to be just far, far more critical and drive them forward to do better things. And that's not just NASA. That's that 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 that's, that's what's happening in China with the ludicrous duplication. Every damn ministry wants his own uh, optical satellite. There seem to be more Chinese optical satellites than any of the sort in the in the uh, in, in the world. So that's a tremendous the wasteful du du duplication go go going on there. We really have no rational uh, plans for developing uh, uh, what we need as an operational uh, observing system uh, uh, at all, despite the best efforts of, of, of organizations like, like GEO. Sorry, I'm sounding off. <laughs> yeah.
So, yeah, there are a few more questions. Probably you see them on the chat. Um, so yeah, long as, yeah. Question from one of my students, uh, uh, Damshe Song, uh, asking an example of how social sciences are expected to involve in the uh, uh, current uh, uh, terms of, 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 of remote sensing. Uh, I think it's the, 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 the issue which Dan Shah raises is, is that it's really tough to get people with knowledge both of the social sciences and also you know, with knowledge of the earth sciences. I, I think what is, what is really needed here is, 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 is for um, people, um, faculty members, to engage with people in the social sciences and then you know, have people who are ready then who, who understand uh, why they're important and then to uh, get agreements to, to jointly uh, uh, co-advise uh, uh, people who want to look about integration because you've got to have both sets of, set, set, sets of people uh, in, involved. Uh, one person who that Dan Shah is very well aware of uh, is, is, is a colleague uh, uh, Pung Song, uh, uh, another one of my students, but he's a real exception in as much as he got a degree in uh, uh, basically GIS, remote sensing, and a degree in economics. He got a double degree, but the number of people like that are very limited. And so, if we're going to get pe if, if we're going to get collaborations, uh, we can't just you know wait till people keep getting double degrees of that sort. We've got to find other mechanisms to get people engaged. And I think it's up to us. Yeah, you know, as as uh, uh, those people more senior to reach out to people in the social sciences and 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 and, and, to, and to get them involved, I think it's absolutely crucial. One of the things I'm doing, you know, as as dean, is to uh, build up the human dimensions of global change to get uh, social sciences uh, uh, social scientists di 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 directly engaged. And perhaps in most sense it will be important to them, perhaps it won't. Perhaps it will be the model outputs which are important. But we've got to get those people defining the agendas. What we can't have is having, a, as is typically the case, where we have a very large uh, biophysical uh, uh, project and then they invite the old social scientists along to help. That is not the way to make progress. The social scientists themselves have to define what the agenda is that interest them, and it's only then I think that we'll make proper progress. Uh, you don't want to ask one this question? Uh, yeah, there is one uh, uh, comment from uh, uh, Ranga about uh, forest cover changes over the past 40 years. What what uh, your can, thoughts can, are on? Can I get that when I can actually read that one? Uh, Monk Shu Li uh, uh, from Arunchi has been out trying to ask uh, uh, questions, uh, uh, this question is whether there's any specific strategic plan or program from NASA on supporting uh, global land cover monitoring research through international collaboration. I mean, NASA does work internationally and is working with, 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 with various, various groups. But I do not know of any attempts at the moment to come up with a really coherent strategy to involve all the main players. I know some of the activities which are going on within GEO, but frankly, that 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 they, they, they leave a lot to be desired. There's certain aspects that are going very well, and one of those I would say is uh, uh, is is, agri uh, is agricultural monitoring, which is showing a lot of improvements uh, over where we were recently. And so. Uh, from, from my dear friend Rangamai Nene, uh, was asking, has the forest cover increased or decreased? And for sure, you know, it, it, it is decreased. But you raise the very valid point is you do have the abandonment of land and you do have, you do have forests uh, tend to come back. But overall, it's, it, 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 is, it is downhill. It's also worth noting that, the, that, that some of the people who uh, look at modeling of economic behavior and, uh, and, and forests the sort of people at the global uh, change uh, the joint global change research institute here at uh, here at maryland and under tony genetos and essentially if you try to model to see what's going to happen to the, to, in the future if you don't put a price on forests 
it doesn't matter what assumptions you make, they're pretty well all gone within 40 years. So unless we can somehow start to value forests and it's worthwhile people not cutting them down, there isn't going to be any forest or no substantial forest left at all. Okay, with that, you know, we have to uh, get ready for uh, Steve Running's presentation, John. So thank you so much for your time. Did you do, and I'm sure uh, Steve will be highly entertaining as he always is. So uh, uh, my good wishes to him, and thank you for this experience, and thank you for your initiative in doing this. It's very much appreciated. Thank you.